uh, that foreign interference in the 2016 um, presidential election and what we just saw in 2018 in terms of the work that was done was a dress rehearsal for the big show of the 2020 elections. Um, and we've had a briefing on this. We know that Special Counsel um, Mueller uh, made clear how the Russians interfered in the 2016 election in his report, in his words, in a sweeping and systematic fashion. Uh, I have made clear that I disagree with uh, how the president has handled this uh, in his meetings with Vladimir Putin, where he has made jokes about it uh, just recently at the G20, where he actually uh, basically said he sided with him over his own intelligence. I'm not going to ask you about that, uh, but I'm going to ask you if you have previously briefed uh, the president about, um, if you personally briefed the president about these threats. Uh, we have had a number of meetings uh, with others in the National Security Council to include the president uh, that deal with uh, Russian efforts to interfere with uh, say the midterms and going forward and things and that we're doing going forward. Were you aware of the, the report where it said that uh, former director Nielsen uh, had been told by officials in the White House to not brief the president on it because it wasn't a good idea for her to do that? Uh, not beyond what I saw in the press coverage that you just mentioned. Okay. So I, I look at how we solve things, and one of the ways I think it would be helpful to solve this is if there was an intrusion in our election. I've heard you talk about how there's two different ways to look at this. One is the physical hacking, and one is the propaganda. And so one of the things that I think would be helpful would be to have backup paper ballots uh, and audits in case that hacking occurs. Do you think that would be helpful for our democracy? Well, uh, as you know, Senator, I think the, the responsibility for election infrastructure, so things like paper ballots, is more in the lane of DHS and its interaction with state and local officials uh, in the election space, although my limited layman understanding in that space is that paper ballots would be a good thing, and it seems to me that redundancy would be in everybody's interest in this such an important space for the country. I appreciate that. Um, and then secondly, on... Um, uh, propaganda issues and particularly um, purchased ads. As you know, last time Russia actually purchased ads with r rubles. Um, do you think it would be helpful to know uh, what those ads are in this next upcoming election, whether they're paid for by Russia or China or uh, by any outside group, to know what they are and who paid for them? Well, uh, we certainly are trying to take a number of steps to raise awareness uh, and working with private sector entities which um, provide platforms for different forms of uh, foreign influence messaging, whether it's propaganda, fake news, or something else. But wouldn't it and be so, helpful just to know the facts? Well, I, I tend to believe that more information is better than less, and I tend to believe that the American public will be better hardened against this threat with greater uh, media literacy uh, and resilience. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I just want to point out one bill I have with Senator Graham, which would uh, force those companies uh, to actually, the social media companies, put out there who paid for the ads and what they are, uh, so we don't have a patchwork system when it comes to the next election. And the second is that Senator Lankford and I had the Secure Elections Act, which would have firmly required backup paper ballots if anyone gets federal election money. Um, the first, the, the second bill was just stopped in its tracks by the White House, and it very much alarms me. Uh, I want to follow up on what uh, Senator Durbin was asking about, and I want to just focus not on the, the homegrown terrorism, which we've seen some of in Minnesota, so I'm well aware of the FBI's work on that front. And I also want to thank you on the other end of the bombing at the mosque, uh, where your agents were incredibly helpful and helped solve that crime. Um, and... Um, uh, why do you think there has been this increase in the number of hate crimes? And I'm talking now about the homegrown terrorism. I'm talking about the hate crimes. So uh, when it comes to the subject of hate crimes, uh, we are seeing an increase in the reporting of hate crimes. We know, I think, fairly widely, I think, accepted in the law enforcement community that hate crimes are historically underreported. Whether the uptick in reporting is because of an uptick in hate crime occurrence or whether an uptick in agencies that now understand the importance of reporting it, it's a little bit hard to tell. 
Uh, we have been doing a lot at the FBI. We've done hundreds of seminars, workshops, trainings, et cetera, of state and local law enforcement around the country, community groups, et cetera, to try to raise awareness to increase the reporting. So okay. I think it's a positive sign on the one hand that there's more reporting. But it's Hard possible to say there's also it means more hate that, crimes, right. I yeah. see. Um, so like many of my colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle, we were very concerned and deeply disturbed by the president's tweets, uh, the chants at the rallies about the four uh, congresswomen. And um, I was particularly concerned because one of those congresswomen is in my state and she was particularly singled out. She had already, uh, thanks to the good work of your agents and local law enforcement, someone who had made a serious threat against her in the past had been arrested and sent to jail. Um, and I'm not gonna ask you if uh, these four women or particularly Congressman Omar has sought protection. I don't think that would be uh, appropriate. But could you tell me what type of assistance the FBI uh, offers members of Congress who are subject to these threats? Um, and what's the efforts underway to track these kinds of threats? Well, certainly anytime uh, someone, including a, a member of Congress, uh, is the subject uh, of, a, of a threat, uh, we hope that they will come forward. We want to try to communicate with them. Uh, if there's enough predication for an investigation, then we'll open an investigation. We will work with uh, security here up on the hill itself uh, sometimes to uh, try to see if we can be of assistance. As far as tracking goes, uh, we have a variety of ways of, of tracking investigations. I don't know that I have something specific to, uh, at least sitting here right now, that's narrowly tailored to threats to members of Congress, but I, I'm sure we're keeping track of it in a variety of ways. Okay, um, just last on the subject of guns, I appreciate it and share um, um, your deep respect for those families and those officers that put themselves, made the uh, ultimate sacrifice. Um, but most of the examples involved guns. And Senator Cornyn asked a question about the background check system. Um, but there's so much more we could do, like closing the gun show loophole um, and here in Congress passing the bill that we had, the bipartisan bill um, to improve background checks. And then also, um, specifically, one of your examples was about domestic violence, a domestic violence report that an officer went to the scene and got killed. We had a similar one like this in Minnesota. And right now, in the um, Violence Against Women Act that passed the House with 33 Republican votes, uh, is a provision that I have long worked on uh, with Senator Hirono and others that closes the um, gun show loop, the, the boyfriend loophole. And if this is where in existing law right now, uh, if you live with someone or you're married to them and you've been convicted of domestic violence and you can't go out and get a gun, but half of those domestic homicides are involving boyfriends or sometimes girlfriends, and there's a loophole that says it doesn't apply if you're convicted uh, and you can't go out and get a gun if you've convicted of domestic violence against a boyfriend. Um, do you think it would be helpful to close that loophole? Uh, I haven't reviewed the particular legislation and I would need to be able to take a look at it to give you a, a sense from an operational perspective. Okay, I just, um, there's, do you agree that there is more we could do besides just the questions from uh, Senator Cornyn when it comes to making the world safer for our law enforcement with regard to guns? Well, we're always looking for ways to enhance the NICS system uh, <laughs> consistent with the law. And I think we clearly need, as I said at the beginning, to take a harder look at uh, violence against law enforcement in this country in a variety of ways. All right, thank you. Senator Cruz. Uh, 